Hello again, everyone. I'm Cleo from the Winchester Skeptics, and I hope you're all as excited as I am for tonight's talk. Skeptics in the Pub Online is about to venture into space, or not, as the case may be. We'll find out soon. Before then, though, I'm really sorry that Kato Mikasa is unable to join us from Uganda tonight to tell us about modern humanism in Africa. It's an important subject, which I certainly don't know enough about, but sadly we had some technical issues which we couldn't sort out in time. We hope to bring you Cato and his talk in the not-too-distant future. We're super fortunate, though, that Brian Ego has stepped into the breach with what looks to be a very entertaining and informative talk. As usual, Brian will talk to us for about 45 minutes, then we'll have a 15-minute break before we get back together again for the Q&A. Please post your questions at sitp.online forward slash ask. And if you want to contribute to our running costs, it's sitp.online forward slash donate. Our mods will post links in the Twitch chat from time to time. For instance, if you want to upgrade your fashion sense with some of our sceptical merchandise. Or to remind you to play nice, although I'm sure that won't be a problem. On to our main event then. A massive thank you to our very own Brian Ego for stepping in at the last minute. A thank you made even bigger by how entertained he's going to keep us all. As an aside, I mentioned he did ask me to keep expectations low, but why would I do that? Brian needs no introduction, as he's a regular host here. He's the one with the Glaswegian accent and the quick wit. Sorry, Brian. He runs the Glasgow Skeptics, and he's also one of the organisers of these online shenanigans. He's an occasional contributor to the Skeptic magazine, and he also has a day job. His background is in engineering, but I'm reliably informed that despite his talk tonight, he's not a rocket scientist. He works in learning and development in the tech world. I won't waffle about his talk, that's Brian's prerogative, but I'm all agog waiting to find out if my belief that the moon landings really happened is actually mistaken. Over to you. All right, thanks very much, Cleo. And audience members, thanks for sticking with us. Sorry we can't bring you uh, Ugandan human rights tonight. Um, I might commit a few atrocities throughout the course of the evening, but um, I'll try and live up to Cleo's expectations of me, which is easier said than done. So let's get stuck in. Firstly, who the hell am I to be doing a talk like this? Well, um, I do have an engineering degree. It was a long time ago and I did nothing with it. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a certificate that sits in a drawer somewhere and that's about it, right? Uh, in the picture there is my younger daughter, Ivy, um, who, and this is the two of us, at the Glasgow Science Centre on the Apollo 11 50th anniversary celebrations. Hence the reason I'm dressed a little bit like one of the uh, mission control dudes there. Um, I have, as Cleo said, been running Glasgow Skeptics for quite some time now. And during those over five years and over 150 events, there's been a number of space topics along the way. Richard Wiseman talking about the Apollo mindset, uh, Martin Hendry, um, whose content I've, I've stolen a lot of tonight, talking about uh, moon landing, um, denialist, etc. So, you know, it's helped inform me to a certain degree. Also, some of my best friends are scientists. So as part of those 50th uh, anniversary celebrations at the Glasgow Science Centre, they asked me to host a panel, um, crazy fools that they were, um, about uh, the moon landing and the hoaxes. So these four lovely people that you see on the slide at the moment uh, were my panel. And, you know, I did a lot of work in advance of that, which has kind of formed the content tonight. And uh, those four panellists helped to uh, knock down a lot of those conspiracy theories. Maybe more on a couple of them later on, time permitting. Also, I've done my research, folks. Um, as far as qualifications is concerned, my engineering degree means nothing, but my Google University certificate is as good if not better than many, many of the moon landing hoaxers out there. So, with that in mind, um, I should also say that the bar's pretty low. Now, here's here's your quick history of moon landing denialism. Over on the left-hand side here, really where it started in the mid-70s, I think it was 76, a gentleman by the name of Bill Casing, who used to work as a technical writer for the Rocketdyne Company, up until like the early 60s, um, released this uh, book or, or overly sized pamphlet called We Never Went to the Moon. And it contains a lot of the, the um, 
the timeless conspiracy theories that we still see today. Just to the right of that, you'll see um, the conspiracy theory documentary that was on Fox, uh, I think sometime in the 90s, late 90s. Now, I know probably you guys will associate the Fox network with, you know, journalistic accuracy, but, you know, maybe it's not always been the bastion of truth that it is now. And then last but not least, as far as sort of um, content's concerned or pre-internet content is concerned, we have a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, which was produced by a gentleman by the name of Bart Sabrell. More on him later. So these are, these are the main fuels of the conspiracy theory. Of course, um, set aflame by the ongoing dumpster fire that is the internet that's taken these conspiracy theories and others and really kind of weaponized them and helped to spread of them and, you know, giving us skeptics um, plenty of material to keep us busy over the years. So, you get to participate a little bit, folks, okay? I've got a few little questions along the way. I don't get to check your answers, so we need to be honest. Answers in the text chat in uh, Twitch, please. What proportion of people in the UK do not believe that we went to the moon? A, one in every 10, B, one in every six, or C, one in every 12. We'll come back to that a little bit later. I should also declare uh, my conflict of interest. Um, I work for IBM and have done so for over two decades now. Um, there's me, uh, you know, in, in my sort of mid to late 20s with hair and, and dreams. Uh, that's my initial work badge there. But obviously, working for IBM, they were involved heavily in the Apollo missions, right? Um, you see a nice image there on the top right-hand side, a picture from the, the, the Hidden Figures movie down in the bottom right-hand side. If you haven't seen that movie, check it out. It's good. Um, so I, I'm not nearly high enough up in the echelons of IBM for, to be let in on any big secrets, but... To date, in my two decades with the company, nobody's taken me aside and told me that all the stuff that we did for the Apollo was fake arama. But if there's any hoaxers watching uh, or hoax proponents watching, you know this is this is how you get me. Okay, this is how you can say that I'm not part of the part of the uh, the inside job. Okay, I'm still waiting on my my payoff, but uh, as far as um, connections is concerned, there is one. Okay, so. If you answered B for my question, you score some points. So as far as conspiracy theories are concerned, we are on the worst timeline here. This is from a 2019 YouGov survey in the UK. And apparently that the numbers are slightly higher with younger people who maybe weren't around at the time of the moon landings. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us, folks. OK, now let's get into the meat of the content here. I've got six sections to go through, and we're going to mix it up a little bit, okay? Cleo's going to be the voice of the audience. You can ask her, all right? But Cleo's essentially going to choose what order I run these in. Why does it matter? Because I'm probably going to talk too much on all of these and run out of time. So whichever ones we cover last are probably going to be the express versions. So, Cleo, disembodied voice of Cleo, what should we start with? Give me a number from one to six. Starting off on six, then. Thank you. Starting off on six. OK, everybody's favourite. So this is looking at photographic shenanigans uh, that the hoaxers think is a smoking gun. So question for the audience. How many pictures during the Apollo missions were taken on the moon? 60, 600 or 6,000 approximately. Guesses in the text chat, please. So let's look at some of these. Um, one of the most common claims uh, of the moon hoax proponents is that we should be seeing stars in the pictures. So the implication is that if we put some star, if it was faked and we put some, you know, some studio lights up to look like stars, we would have got the constellations wrong and some maybe amateur astronomers might have figured it out. So there's never seemed to be any stars showing. However, um, you see, if you look at many, many, many other space photos, almost all of them, you see that we don't see the stars. Uh, and it's simply down to um, camera settings mostly, right? Um, I am not a camera expert. There's a number of crushingly dull explanations about aperture uh, width and uh, uh, what's it called? Frame rate? No, opening, all right? Um, that 
that has an effect, right? But so this is Ed White in 1965, kind of regular camera, uh, low Earth orbit, no stars there. Okay, it, it's almost like during the daytime, right, or during the nighttime in the U uh, in the UK on Earth here, if you stick a camera up at the sky, right? This is my mobile phone camera pointed at my daughter a couple of years ago. It was a beautiful, clear, starry night, yet no stars in the background. Did I fake this uh, um, levitation of my daughter? Maybe, who knows, right? But that is, that's the primary um, explanation for that. And, and it makes total sense. You ask any photographic expert, that's exactly what they're going to tell you. Now, here is uh, the Chang E probe, the Chinese Chang E probe. So again, unless they're in on the, the conspiracy, when they sent uh, a probe to the moon, again, you can see nice light in the foreground, no stars in the background. Are they part of the conspiracy? Doubt it. Also, it should be mentioned that during the Apollo missions, there were some star images taken using the ultraviolet camera, right? So this was one of the panellists from the, the discussion at the Glasgow Science Centre sent me these images. So Apollo 16 had the ultraviolet camera to do an experiment and took, I mean, there's a sample image on the left. Look at the stars. There you go. So, you know, I think we can knock that one down pretty easily. Also, in one of the pictures here, look on the right-hand side. Probably you won't be able to see it, but that that's Venus over there. The, with the, the little yellow arrow is pointing towards. So it's not as if there's n nothing to see there. It's just that the way that the camera settings are set and the bright surface of the moon means they need to keep the aperture size small. And that's what you get. Boring answer, but whatever. Right. Chance for bonus points, everybody. What do the moon hoax proponents think this is? Right. I've enlarged that section there. I've hidden the answer. Get your answers into the, tw the Twitch text chat. Score some bonus points if you figure out what that image they think is. Here we go. Now, here's an interesting one. Photo on the left-hand side. Uh, this is from Buzz Aldrin stepping down uh, off of the lunar module. Um, picture taken by Neil Armstrong. Now, the arguments of the moon hoax proponents is that he's in the shade. We can see way too much of them, right? So, ergo, there must be studio lights, there must be fakery going on. Because I'm sure all of you know on Earth, as soon as somebody steps into shade, you can't see them anymore. Now, interestingly, over on the right-hand side there is a rendering of the same image. So the, the NVIDIA graphics company went to incredible amounts of work to try and recreate this picture digitally using the parameters that were expected to be seen at that point, right? Um, in other words, the sun is, you know, X amount of miles away. It's the single light source. Buzz Aldrin's on the other side of that light, uh, on the other side of the lem, coming down the steps. What would it look like if we, if we recreate that image? And initially, when they first created it, it was actually slightly darker. And then they realised they hadn't accounted for Neil Armstrong and the reflection off of his spacesuit. Factored that in, and look, the two images are almost identical, and one of them's a, a completely computer generated. And blow your minds even more when I tell you I swapped them round. It's the actual picture on the right hand side, and the photographic render on the left hand side. There, absolutely amazing piece of work by Nvidia there. Next common argument is about shadow play. And it says on the right-hand side there, shadows don't lie, NASA does. Pretty compelling, right? Because you, your one source of light is, you know, long, long, long way away. Ergo, the shadows should be parallel. And they're not. They're not in these pictures. What's going on here? Well, a couple of things. Um, firstly, um, you know, if, if, you were, if you were to be on the moon yourself and looking at that with your own two eyes... If you, if you happen to have both your eyes, you'd see the shadows looking more parallel, right? It's a sort of a, a photographic artifact to a certain degree that looks like that. It's also impacted by topography, right? So if something's on a little bit of a slope or like, you know, um, facing a slightly different way, then it has an effect. The photo down at the bottom of that slide particularly um, is, is obvious when you consider that 
the moon hoaxers tend to show the photo as it is there on the slide right now and they don't show the full version of that picture, right? It's a much more panoramic picture there and you can see that the the receiver there is sitting right kind of on the top of a, or, or towards the top of a mound there, right? So the topography is different. But you don't have to even take my word for it, right? You can see this on Earth, right? Take some pictures on Earth and you can see shadows going in different directions. Unless, of course, all of these photos are fake Earthers uh, done by, I don't know, whatever the opposite of NASA is, right? So it's a common photographic phenomenon that we completely ignore. Um, but gets examined to the nth degree by the hoaxers. Also consider as well, if you have multiple light sources, you're more likely to get multiple shadows or at least blurred shadows. So, you know, looking at this sort of football game here, you used to see it more in the 70s when it was kind of just spotlights in the corner. You would see that foreshadow effect pretty common. There's also complaints that the cameras wouldn't work, uh, you know, on the moon um, because of you know, things like heat uh, and, and pressure, etc. But these were specially, um, specially set up cameras or the, the, the configurations that NASA had for the cameras to work. It's not, you know, they just didn't just pick it up uh, um, off of the shop, uh, shop floor, right? These have all been modified, different type of lubricants in them, extra insulation to protect the camera film, etc., etc. And again, picture over there on the right-hand side of Ed, Wo Ed White using, you know, a, a similar camera, and he's in low Earth orbit there. So again, unless you think that all space photography is fake, then it's just as likely, just as easy to take pictures on the moon as it is in low Earth orbit. Another one from the hoaxers is the crosshairs. Or, um, so th those little kind of oh, looks like little plus signs that you see there um, on, on the images. Those were part of the, the, the photographic plate inside the cameras. So you should never see anything in front of those. Yet um, the, the crosshair here appears to have something in front of it, which smacks of fakery apparently. But if you look at a high quality image, a high quality version of that picture, you'll see that the crosshair is there and the two little kind of red stripes towards the lower um, the lower part are more visible as well. So it's an it's an image quality thing, just causing, again, exposure causes the white to, to bleed out. There's lots of examples of that and it's easily explained again. My personal favourite is this one here. So picture of a rock, the top one there, that looks like looks like it has the letter C on it. Because again, if you were going to fake a moon landing, how many how many props do we have on our fake moon set? 26 maximum. And this one presumably has the letter C on it and we have it sent, you know, it's been set up the wrong way. Now, if you look at the picture down below, you see that as the original picture that doesn't have it on it. So this, what you see apparently is a letter C. Again, I'm no expert in photography or moon landing, but I do know a short and curly when I see one, right? Um, th this is this is something that's a little anomaly when something's been redeveloped or reprinted or something. Um, it's nothing to see here. It's not a smoking gun by any stretch of the imagination. This one's cool too. Uh, again, look at the background up at the top left-hand side. See the mountains in the background? No lunar module in the foreground, whereas on the right-hand side there, same background, but the lunar module's there. So the implication is that, um, you know, they used the same, the same fake background twice uh, for different areas, uh, for, or they took one picture before the, the crane had dropped the, lunar, lunar mo the fake lunar module in there or not, right? So you see it's been kind of blended together down, down at the bottom there. Now, this again, is pretty easily explained. And I did this in the back garden of the luxurious Ego Mansions, right? So little skull wine bottle holder there, right? Think of that as a lunar module. I've even put a little Lego guitar holding spaceman dude just to the left of it, right? Look at the, look at the, the, the bushes, the trees in the background there. Consider that my background. Now, look at the picture on the right-hand side. Same background, no lunar module. 
no little Lego spaceman. Ooh, what's going on here? Did Brian fake his uh, his little pretend moon landing landing area? Well, well, no, I didn't. All I did was I moved slightly to the right and took a picture of the same background. And you can see that if I just expand that right hand picture, can you just see the tip of the left hand uh, or the, the left hand side of the skull there? OK, so it just shows I just moved slightly across. The background looks almost identical, almost as if um, humans aren't very good at judging distances um, and, and judging perspective. Easily explained away again. Also, the moon hoaxers have spent a long time looking at uh, video images, making allegations that like the the. Um, the videos are just uh, shot on Earth and slowed down, um, and they're like on the top left hand side there. You can see some some unusual looking stuff, or they have um, they have like wires. The astronauts have wires holding them up, right? So if you look at the top right hand side, you'll see some little little pointy fingers there. Now up at the top right hand side, what you're actually seeing is the antenna. Uh, on their backpacks, just kind of occasionally catching some light um, rather than anything else. And also, like one of the examples is, I think it was Apollo 14 or 15, um, when when he was saluting in front of the 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 flag, he jumped up, right? And it takes him like, like over a second to go up and come back down again, right? If you tried to sort of recreate that on Earth, it would be impossible. It would be like Olympic jumper to do that. Just for fun, bottom right hand side here, bonus point if anybody said Capricorn 1. So this was a movie later on in the 70s about NASA faking a trip to Mars, which unfortunately has been taken by a lot of the moon hoaxy proponents that you could somehow fake that um, or they somehow fake the, the journey to the moon beforehand. Lots of fun stuff about um, Stanley Kubrick and The Shining. So, bonus points available. The 237 on, on the, the door key there, the door number, why is that significant? Because in the book, in the Shining book, it's room 217. So, why is it 237 here? Why do the hoaxers think that's significant? Also, they think the kid with the Apollo top on is, is somehow like a tip of the hat by Kubrick. Also, if you're looking on the big picture on the right-hand side, you got Jack Nicholson there, and you see in the wall in the background, the sort of, I guess... So look like sort of Native American totem images almost. People think they look a little bit like Saturn V rockets. There's also some other stuff as well, like when he's when Jack Nicholson's bouncing his ball against the wall, apparently like it like on after the eleventh time it misses one or something, or you don't hear it, or they've taken the audio out. It's it's funny stuff, right? And most of the, the Stanley Kubrick stuff is fueled by this image. And there's Kubrick there with Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke and some NASA people in 1965. Now, um, a normal person might think, well, he's doing a movie shortly, the 2001 in Space Odyssey, about space travel. So who better to talk to than some NASA folks to consult on it, right? But it's taken as some kind of um, admission of, of uh, you know, evil skullduggery on behalf of Kubrick, which has never been proven. Okay, so, Paradolia fans, if you said it looked like a studio light, score yourself some points. That's what this looked like. Um, if you think, uh, if you got the 237 as 237,000 uh, miles to the moon from Earth-ish, uh, that you get points for that. The real reason, and again, if anybody stuck something in the Twitch chat about this, the real reason they had 237 there instead of the 217 in the book is the actual hotel that they're at has a room 217. And apparently they said, could you not use 217 in the movie, please? We don't want to freak out any of our customers in the future. So they chose a room number that doesn't actually exist in that hotel. Number of pictures on the moon, 6,000. So again, if you were NASA thinking we need to fake this, would you take, would you have that many pictures? Because bear in mind, the hoax proponents spend a lot of their time poring over all of these images, looking for some of the anomalies. And there's, there's hundreds more, okay? Hundreds more quote-unquote anomalies. Um, I've just picked 
the most obvious and, uh, and, and common ones that prop up or pop up on their Facebook pages. Okay, phew, drink for me. Cleo, what's next? I have no idea what Bart Attack is, so we'll go for number four. Okay, let's go to Bart Attack. Okay, so Bart, Bart Cybrell, Bart Cybrell, who um, produced the funny thing uh, happened on the way to the moon movie, um, is the the sort of king of all um, hoax proponents. He spends a lot of his time, or did spend a lot of his time, chasing around after the Apollo astronauts, trying to get them to swear on Bibles, putting together um, documentaries. Now, this sort of stunning crescendo of uh, of his documentary is 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 the moonshot which we'll come to now fact fans which Apollo 11 astronaut punched Bart Cybrell was it Armstrong Aldrin or Collins answers in Twitch chat please so the claim here is the smoking gun that Bart Cybrell got some accidentally sent some footage by NASA when he requested it. That's not true. Um, the footage was fully available. But the claim in the documentary is that um, the the footage shows signs of fakery. And I gotta explain this, right? So this is this is that famous window shot here. Right? And to give a bit of context, right, this is apparently they've taken when they were when the uh, the Apollo 11 mission was about halfway to the moon. They looked back towards Earth. Cool shot for everybody. Right. That's what it looked like. You can see the Terminator line on the right hand side there. Here's what Earth looks like from the ISS from close up. OK, um, much bigger, obviously, because you're right next to it. So. The allegation is that the Apollo astronauts were not on their way to the moon. They were in lower Earth orbit. So they had to do something to try and give the impression that they were further away, right? And this is apparently how they did it, right? So there's the Earth, right? Let's pretend you're in low Earth orbit. Oops-a-daisy, that's too big. How do we make it smaller? Okay, circular window. Great job done. The Earth looks small. And then the allegation is they also cut a little piece of kind of elliptical cardboard to, to simulate the Terminator line here, right? So that's the allegation. That's what is being claimed um, in that movie, right? Um, it's it's literally small versus far away. It is the father Ted of all claims. And 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 it's, you know, it, it's obviously ridiculous, right? Because, you know, you'd be able to tell a mile away that you were closer than that. And, and you know, the, the image went on for a long time that, the only problem is, like, the astronauts were trying to make the, the interior of the LEM as dark as possible to get that clear image. So there's some kind of moving around, which gives that impression. So as I say, Bart Sabrell spends a lot of his time chasing after astronauts and getting them to swear on the Bible. Alan Bean actually did swear on the Bible, after which he told him to go F himself, uh, which was fun. But um, if you answered Buzz Aldrin, uh, you'd be correct. Here's the scene here. Okay, now, uh, skeptics in the pub online and uh, Glasgow skeptics do not in any way condone violence, and it wasn't me that cut that video to show the punch multiple times, um, but it's entertaining nonetheless. Um, for context, that was the third time that Bart Sabrell had harassed. Um, Buzz Aldrin. Uh, at this particular time, Buzz Aldrin thought he was on the, on his way to film uh, to help uh, be interviewed as part of a Japanese kids program, uh, and he was sort of hijacked and harassed at that point. So, not condoning violence, but mm. okay, let's move on. Cleo, what's next? Let's have number five. Belt up. Okay, okay. Let's get belted. So, here we go. The Van Allen radiation belts. Question for you, lunar lovers. Approximately, right now, how many satellites currently operate inside the Van Allen radiation belt? 15, 75, or 800? So, from the Moon Hoaxer Facebook group, the general idea here is that nobody, your humans, could never make it through the Van Allen radiation belts. 
this is a two belts, occasionally three, depending on solar activity of radiation um, that that are kind of in the in the the sort of magnetic sphere around the Earth, right? Um, these were detected by some of the earlier earlier uncrewed missions, where they saw some fluctuations in radiation levels at various points of the um, of the orbit that the 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 thing was taking, the the vehicle was taking. So. Um, and here we are. There's an image on the left-hand side. There's the van, the van, uh, the van Allen belt. Was there van Halen belts? And look, it, the image looks scary. You can imagine that in a sci-fi movie. That's sort of making a kind of a kind of kind of noise, right? So the funny thing is, James Van Allen himself, you know, who who discovered those belts, watched that Fox documentary. Uh, and he himself commented on it, right, saying, like, the claim that radiation exposure during the Apollo missions would have been fatal is only one example of such nonsense, right? So, um, yes, there was radiation. Yes, they had to plot a careful course to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, and I know there's been various arguments about angle uh, angle of traje trajectory, et cetera, as they come out, right? But simple fact is... Um, we can get out there safely, right? Or we could. It just it took some careful navigation techniques um, and without too much shielding. A lot of the hoaxers will tell you you need like seven feet of lead, right? And that's just simply not required. And, you know, to back that up, all of the Apollo astronauts carried dosimeters on them. And, you know, what, what they, what they uh, incurred, you know, going out and back again was a fair amount of radiation. It was like, you know, if you were a read if you worked in a rate you were a radiation worker, you get like about a year's worth of the dosage there, right? So higher than your average Joe, but certainly not enough to kill you and not enough to, you know, seriously affect your long term health as far as we know. Some of the uh, Apollo astronauts live for good long lives, Buzz Aldrin's still with us as well. Of course the hoaxers will say that all this is faked. Um but you can't please everyone. If you guessed 800, you'd be correct. Um, I got that from NASA's fun Van Allen probes, uh, fun facts uh, uh, webpage, which presumably some poor intern at NASA had to put together. Um, those facts aren't as fun as you might imagine, folks, but feel free to go and have a read. Okay, Cleo, what's next? Uh, let's have a two, please, Brian. All right, lunar tricks. Okay. So... This is uh, a lot around uh, the lunar module, um, the lunar rover, etc. So let's ask first, which Apollo 11 astronaut nearly died during a lunar module test flight? Armstrong, Aldrin or Collins? Answers in Twitch chat. Now, here's the main allegation, right? And this is, you know, a, a pretty common meme that you'll see in, you know, many moon hoaxy type places, essentially saying that, you know, the, the lunar module looks like something like a kid would put together with their Meccano set and wrapped in tinfoil, right? And let's not deny, folks, it doesn't look too sexy, right? Which, you know, again, if I was going to fake a moon landing, my lunar module would be much sexier than that, right? And much nicer looking, right? But... They had, um, you know, function rather than fashion in mind when they designed it, right? And you only need to look a little bit beneath the, uh, you know, heat protective layers that you see on the outside there to see the real mastery of the, the lunar modules, the lunar excursion modules. So schematic diagram on the left-hand side there, middle one's a prototype, Right hand side, you see actual construction. The technology that went into these was phenomenal, uh, and you can read about them in massive detail. And there are full documentaries of them. And there's, you know, uh, tours inside the module and how and how they were put together. And again, a lot of the functionality that's there. There's people that will wax lyrical at great length about them. Right. Just the simple fact was they didn't look very nice. The coating on the outside, right, wasn't just tinfoil, right? It was pretty highly specialised stuff simply because, you know, the lunar surface can get hot and cold and the retention and distribution of heat uh, uh, was very important to help uh, prevent any kind of significant failures in the vehicle while it was sitting on the moon's surface. Makes plenty of sense. 
correct answer was Neil Armstrong. Here's the footage. Now, here's the thing as well. Trying to test the lunar module, right? Lunar module was designed for one-sixth of gravity on the moon, uh, one-sixth of Earth's gravity on the moon. So testing it on Earth was really difficult. They had a simulator, and they had this weird, bizarre kind of techno spider type thing, which, again, was pretty cool, but um, uh, a little bit hard to... Uh, oops. A little bit hard to, to pilot, as you can see, right? So don't worry, everybody. Neil Armstrong was fine. He ejected just at the right moment. Um, good bit of premature ejection there from, from Armstrong. So really hard to test, but they got it right on the day. Lunar Rover. Let's talk about the Lunar Rover. Used in the, the, the later, I think, 15, 16, and 17 had their own little vehicle. 17 tra uh, travelled the furthest. How far did it go? 22, 44, or 66? Guess is in the Twitch chat, please. Okay, let's move on. So, lots of uh, hoaxers calling foul here, right? Um, this picture here, no tracks in front of uh, or behind the so-called Lunar Rover. Well, no, no tracks in front of it because they haven't driven forward yet in that direction, probably. Behind it, you can't really see in that picture. And again, it depends on how much dust there was on the surface. And the, if you look at the Lunar Rover on the right-hand side image there, it does look too big. How on earth did it fit in there? Some spectacular lubrication, I would imagine, right? Or, or not. So here's how they fitted it in. It was essentially like a little um, a little origami type operation that was happening, right? On the left-hand side there, you see it folded up. If you look in the middle image, top right-hand side, that's a kind of a sky down look um, on, on the lem, and you can see the rover there. And the little um, kind of gif on the right-hand side there shows how it would be sort of unfolded, right? So fantastic. Um, you know, technology there, and and you know, it had to weigh like like less than five hundred pounds or something. It was just fantastic that they managed to achieve that. Unfortunately, it still didn't go that far. So, any of you seeing forty four or sixty six, nil point for you. The twenty two ers have you, but it allowed them to get a lot further around the surface of the moon for those last couple of um, Apollo missions. There's also talk about the craters below. Um, or the lack of craters below the lunar module, right? So again, on the image here, uh, um, the top half of the image shows shows the Apollo 11 lunar module, and there's no, you know, there's no crater blast below it. The image below that is one of the um, one one of the Mars landers, and you can see like it's sort of made a uh, the rocket thrust has made a crater down below that, right? Now, one of these things is not like the other, okay? Moon. Mars, not the same, okay? Also, those vehicles landing on them, not the same either, right? So let's drill down on that a little bit. I think the problem is, like, a lot of the the sort of um, graphic depictions like you see on the left-hand side were somewhat dramatic looking, right? You can see the sort of blast crater down there, right? On the right-hand side, though, there's the actual picture. Not much going on, right? Now, a couple of explanations for that. Number one, the moon, very much like one of Dave Jenkins' parties, has no atmosphere, right? So the, 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 the thrust being expelled from the rocket disperses very quickly out to the side. There's no kind of air resistance that it's met with, right? On top of that as well, as it was coming down, it was coming down at an angle um, and slight incline as well. They were lowering the thrust, lowering the thrust as they come down. And though if you watch the footage, you can see a fair amount of dust being blown out to the side, but not as much as you might expect. And also, the thrust stopped right about six feet, or, you know, just below, just less than six feet before they hit the surface, right? Again, just, they're coming down at one six gravity. So they switched off the thrusters just before they get towards the ground there. So what you see is the blowing away of, of dust, yes, right? Also remember the dust doesn't plume. So the, um, the, the, the foot pads of the lunar module do not, we do not expect to see them covered in dust. And that's exactly what we get, right? So again, all debunked. As far as getting back off of the moon again, this kind of liftoff stage here um, is somewhat unspectacular, right? 
Now, a lot of the hoaxers seem to think that they left a cameraman behind to film that. But no, there was just some clever timing done. Um, and it was a camera that was m mounted on the, the rover. Uh, and it was set to, to, to um, stay, pan up as, uh, you know, as the, the LEM took off, the upper part of the LEM took off. They got it wrong with Apollo 16. This is Apollo 17 taking off there, right? And again, so the hoaxers will tell you that it's a crane just pulling it up. They'll also say, look, there's no, you don't see any thrust from the rocket, right? And, you know, there's there's an, unfortunately a rather boring explanation for that. Just a different type of accelerant used in the, in the rockets there, right? And we can actually see an example of that. Left-hand side, space shuttle, whoa, 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 big flames. Right-hand side, this is the liftoff of a British Black Arrow satellite launcher sometime between 69 and 71. They're using the same type of accelerants as, uh, or similar type of accelerants as a lunar module uh, takeoff area there, and you don't see any flames or plume or anything underneath it. God bless the British to create, uh, you know, a rocket that looks like a sort of a levitating sex toy. Well done, us Brits. So all easily explained. Footprints on the moon as well. Um, again, hoaxers will say that's not possible. Uh, they'll uh, assume that it was sand and there needs to be some element of water in there. But again, that's not the case, right? The Mythbusters were able to simulate the lunar regolith in a vacuum uh, and sort of recreate it, okay? And it's just down to the, 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 the physics of that lunar regolith. It's, like, you know, it's a little bit like flour, but uh, it tends to stick more together as well, right? So it will kind of interact with each other and, and, and clump when pressure's put on it, exactly as we'd expect to see. Points available again, folks. Which company made the spacesuits? Levi, Adidas, or Playtex? We'll come to that. There's also hoaxers are seeing this. Am I missing something? Neil Armstrong space boots. Footprint down below doesn't match. Somebody had a mic drop moment to respond to that. Yes, it's Buzz Aldrin's footprint, first of all. Secondly, they put on overshoes. So again, this type of meme embarrassingly crops up a lot, uh, and it's a sign of hoaxers not bothering to do the barest amount of research. Now, don't get me wrong, some of them are very meticulous, right? But the fact that these type of things crop up again and again tells you a lot about the people that are doing it. There's also claims that the suits wouldn't be able to work properly in the moon. And again, similar to the to the LEM, if you want to see the technology that goes into these spacesuits, it was amazing. Incredible technology, right? And if you answered Playtex, and Playtex was like a bra making company when I was a kid. So you got some uh, sexy seamstress work going over there on the right hand side. Pretty cool, right? Again, amazing mixture of kind of old school seamstress technology and space age um, materials. Brilliant stuff. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay, how many have we got to go? Come on, Cleo, what's up next? Uh, for our second last one, we'll have techno, please. Techno. Okay, right. So, if you watch a funny, and, and don't, by the way, but if you watch a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, this is where we get this part from. Now, at the peak of Apollo spending, what percentage of the federal total did NASA's budget reach? 0.97, 2.15, or 4.41? Guess is in the Twitch text chat, please. So the start of Bart Sabrell's documentary is basically a, 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 a montage of rocket failures, right? They're trying to give the impression that everything was awful uh, about the, you know, the space program. And don't get me wrong, there were a lot of failures, right? But we learned from every single one of them, and we had plenty of successes to talk about as well, right? Comedy material, good stuff, right? But let's take a look at, at the bigger picture here, right? Let's put all of those failures aside and look at some successes, right? Now, on my timeline here, you see the Apollo missions towards the right-hand side there, late 60s uh, into the early 70s, and the first man, the moon, Apollo 11 there. But that is not the entirety of the American moon program or the space program, right? There's a lot more that was going on there. So consider the Mercury and the Gemini programs as well that were going on. Many, many missions going on before we got to Apollo. And that's crewed missions. Look at all of the uncrewed missions that were going on as well, right? 
And if we drill into those a little bit, look at the milestones that are happening here, right? First American in space there, first orbit, multiple orbits, 22 orbits, first multi-person space travel, first spacewalk, first rendezvous, first docking, five-hour spacewalk, as you get up, and that's pre-Apollo, right? So for the hoaxers, try and decide at what point the fakery starts. A lot of them will just say, well, it was just at the Apollo ones, fair enough, right? But if you look at all of the work that went ahead in those other programs, you'll see how they built up towards the pinnacle of achievement in, in getting to and landing safely on the moon. It all makes sense, and they worked up well to it. Consider as well on the underside, those evil Russians, sorry, Igor. Um, if you think about that, the, you know, th this was a race. It was a race that was happening. And the Russians were kicking ass big time, right? If you look at their the, some of their landmarks, they were way ahead of the Americans in many respects along the way there. The, the, the Americans weren't so bothered about a woman in space. 1963, Valentina Tereshkova, you know, the Americans weren't bothered with that unless they wanted someone to go and make sandwiches for the men. Um, but other than that, like, you know, Russia were first in many, many of these steps along the way. But there's actually some great, um, there's some great videos by Curious Droid about the Russian moon program and kind of how it went off the rails a little bit. Um, and, and how they weren't able to, to keep up with America towards the end of that space race, right? But let's remember, that space race to the moon was arbitrary, right? Russian, Russia had won a lot of the battles along the way there, right? And again, if you're, if you're a moon hoaxer, you know, maybe figure out, what, you know, which part did the Russians fake anything, right? They were landing uncrewed missions on the moon in the late 50s. So, if you said 4.41%, uh, you'd get some points, right? The amount of money the Americans spent on getting to the moon was insane, right? So for those people who are saying, well, why haven't we gone back, right? It was the same answer I gave to my two older kids, why we don't go back to Florida, right? Sorry, cost too much money. Plus, I got a lot of radiation exposure that a pale Scotsman like me is not used to, right? That's, that's the main reason why we haven't been back since then. It costs a damn fortune and p to be quite honest by the time we got to apollo 17 people were bored nobody was watching it on telly anymore they had to have golf gimmicks and stuff right okay Whew. let's finish up all right how are we doing for time okay i'll make this part quick which one have i not done oh yeah okay good on you cleo picking the most boring part of the presentation to finish up with thanks for that okay so flag stuff how many American flags are still on the moon? Is it zero? Is it five? Or is it six? Answers in Twitch, please, people. So the moon hoaxers will say that any sign of movement of the flags is a sign of fakery because there's no wind on the moon. They must have been on a studio set somewhere or out in Area 51. Of course, what they, many of them don't take into account uh, take into account is there's a truss rod along the top to hold the flag in place and in all of those all of the footage there you can see there's still an astronaut with his hand on it right or you see it moving a little bit after he takes his hand off of the flag let's remember yes there's no atmosphere or air on the moon but momentum still does exist right so that kind of kicks a lot of that off but there's a couple of weird ones as well right so I don't want a straw man the hoaxers here, right? Look at this one, right? I don't know if you see this video too well, but astronaut walks past. Oh, there's a flag moving. Now, here's the thing, right? Unless the astronaut brushed, physically brushed that flag on the way past, then there is something amiss there, right? But it's difficult to tell from the perspective of the camera how close the astronaut was to that flag. The hoaxers will tell you he was too far away and he just made a little breeze and that's the, the flag blowing in the breeze. I think it's the other. I think it's just the astronaut just brushed the corner of that with his, uh, with his shoulder, with his arm. On this one here, just look at the very far right hand side there. Can you see the flag moving ever so slightly? And again, there's... We, okay, it's a clear smoking gun, right? Now... There's no astronaut uh, in that in that one, right? What's happening, again, if you Google 
you'll see um, there was actually like uh, occasional ventilation happening from the lunar module. And that, uh, you know, like um, air pressure vents coming out of the lunar module, which can explain that. So again, there are logical explanations available if you have the interest to go look at them. Right, now, answers to this question, how many American flags still on the moon? If you answered zero or you answered five, uh, I'm gonna give you points, right? And let me explain. So each of the Apollo missions planted a flag. However, Apollo 11 planted it either not very well or a bit too close to the lunar module. So when the lunar module took off, flag blew over, right? So as far as standing on the moon, um, that, that is what we expect, right? Um, still to be five flags standing. However, they've been there for a long time. Um, so chances are they've been bleached completely white. Um, so unless you count, uh, they're, no, they're no longer American flags. So probably zero or five, right? If you want to know more about flags, ask Tom Williamson, right? So points for both of those um, if you got that. Okay, now, that's us through the main segments. Just a couple of things to finish off, right? Um, let me skip to the end here. Conspiratorial thinking, there's a number of, there's a number of potential things happening here, right? Um, the, there's the, the, the story up at the top left-hand side is kind of, you know, a great excuse for skeptics to be snipey, right? Um, more highly educated you are, the less likely you are to be into conspiracy theories. Sure, right? That, that's true. But there's a lot of very, very intelligent people out there that still believe that the moon landing was a hoax. So please don't make assumptions, right? Um, you know, there's some, some of the reasons on screen there you'll see why people start to believe those things they do, right? And there's just certain people out there who have kind of sort of hyperactive, um, um, you know, ability to link things and it just kind of goes into a little bit of overdrive. So what can we do about it? Well, you know, that's a talk for another time. Why does it matter? Because, um, you know, moon landing itself, you know, whether it was faked or not, well, you know, if we found out it was a fake, oh, cheeky American government, ah, you've done another one. But the type of people that believe in the moon landing hoaxes are also the type of people that believe in some of the awful stuff you're seeing on screen here, right? We've got Donald Trump, um, you know, tweeting about global warming being a hoax. You've got Alex Jones sort of setting his, you know, um, audience of simpletons onto the, the poor, poor grieving parents of Sandy Hook. You've got the, the January 6th insurrection uh, of last year. You've got Dr... Dr. Robert Malone on the Joe Rogan experience there talking nonsense about vaccines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, there, there is a downside, you know, the, the moon hoax thing is is not uh, is not in a vacuum, unfortunately, right? And also, unfortunately, it's not helped by the fact there are times when our government or other governments around the world do some horrible stuff, Right. Hillsborough on the top right hand side, Brexit bus. Um, you've got, um, you know, Nixon up at the top left hand side. Um, you know, the war in Iraq, you know, and weapons of mass destruction. There are plenty of times where the government aren't being honest with us. We, as skeptics and the public in general, need to be able to kind of separate out the times when they are telling the truth and the times when they aren't. Um, it's just unfortunate. They're not making it easy for us by some of these type of things, right? So we have to be aware of that um, when when we're talking with people who believe these type of hoaxes. Okay, so um, just before I finish, on screen now, you know, for a, an uneducated person like me, I got a lot of my reference from these fantastic YouTube channels. Really, really interesting stuff. Please take a look at them. Plenty of good blogs. There's Phil Plates, Bad Astronomy as well, and lots of other places you can go. Not just to kind of debunk moon hoaxes, but just to kind of get a sense of joy and majesty about the Apollo program, right? I'm not a big fan of the American government and NASA in general, but... I think it was an amazing achievement and it's really, really interesting to go find out more. So please, please do. After the break, we're going to take your questions, but I also want a little bit more from you as well, audience, because I want I want you to tell me 
We've been doing the debunking of the hoaxers, but I want to flip that over a little bit during the break. Tell me what your what you think the best evidence is that we did go to the moon. Okay, so stick that into the text chat and Twitch. We'll harvest some of that during the break and we shall investigate it when we come back. Questions as well, of course. I'll do my best to answer, but as you've seen already, I am not an expert. Okay, back to you, Cleo. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, There's an awful lot there that I had no idea about and I suspect the same is true for everyone. And we'll have a think about your question. Yeah, nothing comes to mind at the moment. Um, so a reminder to everyone that we'll be hosting our regular pub, the Lockins Razor, after the Q&A. Please head over to Slido. We need some fun questions in there. And it's now time to go off and do all the intervally things that we all need to do. And we'll see you back here at 10 past eight. Thanks. Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope you've all got full glasses and empty bladders and it's time to move on with our Q&A. But actually, just before we start with the Q&A, uh, Brian did ask you an interesting question at the end of his talk and he's had some answers. So let's hear a little bit about that first. I did, yeah, thanks Cleo. Some answers, but not all that I was expecting. So partial points to your audience, but let's, let's take the ones that you did get. Um, somebody mentioned the retro reflectors. Um, which is a, a sort of array of reflectors that were put on the moon that allowed us to bounce uh, a laser there and back again, right? It's actually, they, they do that during the, the Mythbusters episode. Now, on the panel I had at Glasgow Science Centre was Professor Jim Fowler. He was a guy that, that, that invented those and he worked with the Apollo programme to have that put up there, right? So when I, and he's kind of an old dude now. So when I was running a panel, and he and and he uh, was introduced to me. He didn't realise I was one of the nice sceptics that actually believed him. He thought I was one of the other type of sceptics that we don't like to mention. But lovely guy. Interestingly, he um, was, I think, went for dinner with the, the, the astronauts like the night uh, for Apollo 15 the night before. And he said, look, Brian, if they were if they were faking it, they were really faking being hell of a nervous the night before as well, which was phenomenal, right? Okay, somebody also mentioned moon rocks. Good on you. Um, the Apollo missions brought back loads of moon rocks, right? But unfortunately, some of them got lost. Some of them are fake. Uh, and that's kind of fuels the, um, fuels the hoaxers a little bit. But certainly, like, for the genuine ones, you know, there's a... I guess a, a, a chemical footprint there that you can see it definitely came from the moon and didn't just kind of fall as a meteor or what have you. Um, some of you saying I saw it on the telly, um, which I think is good enough evidence as well, or all of some of those 6,000 pictures we spoke about. Somebody also mentioned Russia as well. Um, so yeah, and it, it is interesting to see like how they kind of didn't quite make it to, to the moon or man mission to the moon or crewed mission to the moon, but the general consensus is amongst rational people is if the Americans faked it, the Russians would have called it out. So the moon hoaxers will actually tell you that, you know, there's a sort of a, sh this is where you get sort of Illuminati, new world order, shadow one world government type, you know, so they have to take their conspiracy and upgrade it significantly in the same way, actually, when, when, when Michael Marshall interviewed Mark Sargent, the flat earther, Mark Sargent will will um, allege that the entire Cold War was a sort of a fake, you know. Um, so they've really got to weaponize that conspiracy to, to try and get traction to it. So good enough answers, but um, what you missed out on, folks, um, was uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, that's got uh, the, from the early 2000s, or was it 2010-odd, that's actually taken reasonably good pictures of of the Apollo landing sites. Again, the hoaxers will claim they're faked. Um, also, um, radio fans, uh, there were a number of amateur radio types who were able to, to sort of tune in to the Apollo missions, particularly Apollo 11. Um, and they were, let, let's be very clear, they were pointing their little antennas to the moon, okay, not towards Houston, right? And if you want to, I, I did actually contact Mark Pentler off of Edinburgh Skeptics, who 
is a, an amateur radio fan. He spends a lot of his time out in fields pointing antennas in various directions. And I kind of asked him, like, would could you fake that in any way? Could they, like, put some kind of unmanned radio probe or radio unit and, and dump it onto the moon and pretend the signals were coming from there? And he said no, right? So the fact that you've got amateur radio types who have verified it is, is just incredible, right? And, you know, may, maybe last but not least, conspiracies don't stay secret generally, okay? And I know, like, NASA at their height had, like, 400,000 employees. Now, again, the hoaxers will tell you, well, not all 400,000 had to know about it. Yeah, but a fair amount would have had to know about it, right? And one thing I've never seen from any of the hoaxers is a detailed analysis of exactly, like, how few people you could get it to, right? Obviously, the three astronauts, oops, no, sorry, it's not three, it's 18 because there were six Apollo missions and the, and a lot of the, the supporting crew and, you know, a lot of the IBM staff who were monitoring um you know, applications in real time. Uh, Richard Nixon, the president, who had a phone call to Neil Armstrong, he would have had to be in the know. <laughs> Not that Richard Nixon's known for telling the occasional untruth, right? But, um, okay, so you score some points there, dear, dear viewers, but not as many as I expected. Raise your game, please. Okay, well, maybe the questions will raise the game. Hit me with your best shot, Cleo. Well, there were some. I thought there were some good ones, but maybe my, my bar's a little lower than yours because I know less about it. Um, so the first question comes from Igor, uh, and um, Igor says, "Assuming we don't kill ourselves in a couple of decades and we'll return to the moon, do you think the conspiracy theorists will come up with new stuff? In fact, are they still coming up with new stuff, or is it just all the old stuff?" Um, well, okay. So I mean, they are they are already coming up with new stuff. Um, obviously. You know the 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 lunar reconnaissance reconnaissance orbiter pictures brought up you know new new denials from them and the various probes getting sent to the moon does sort of flare up activity in in their Facebook group right as far as as far as like genuinely brand new stuff not not much right because there's only there's only a finite number of pictures and vid pieces of video footage to go through um, you know I. I do occasionally see some incredibly technical um, assertions being made, um, which I am in no position to attempt to debunk. But you know, a lot of them have already been debunked. If you go and if you go and do a bit of googling, right? So I I don't think there's too much. But yeah, absolutely. Like uh, the the problem is though, right? When when we go back to them, and hopefully in not not too distant future, I'm not entirely sure we're going to get up close and personal to the Apollo landing sites. So um, it will at least um, sort of completely refute the fact that, you know, humans can't go through the Van Allen radiation belts. That's a kind of a hard line in the sand for many, many of the hoaxers, right? And if we're able to go outside of that, well, they'll, they'll move the goalpost and they'll say, well, it's 21st century technology that allows us to get through the Van Allen radiation belts, right? So, um, you know, Long answer to a short question. Sorry about that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll make up new stuff. They'll move the goalposts, without a doubt. No, no, long answers are good. It means it was a good question. Um, Dave Jenkins asks, what's the hardest idea to debunk on the fly without slides, etc.? Well, <laughs> without slides. I never go anywhere without my slides, Dave. Um, I'm bust out a PowerPoint at the drop of a hat. So, like, let me be very clear. There's nothing here that I've debunked, right? It's stuff that I've found, um, you know, by reputable intelligence sources in multiple places that that, that essentially debunks it, right? So, um, you know, let, let's let's put let's put the the uh, the idea that I might have be able to debunk anything off the top of my head completely out, right? But, you know, what one of the other panelists at Glasgow Science Centre that night, Ma Matteo. You know he's he's a regular at Glasgow Skeptics, and he he's a lecturer in space systems at um, at, at Glasgow University, right? But I would not advise him to get into a, like a face to face, you know, minute to minute, second to second debate with a moon hoaxer, because for the moon hoaxers, that's their baby, that's their precious, and they nurture it and they feed it every time, and they and they know so much, 
right? That like anybody off the top of their head, no matter how good their expertise, is not going to know. In fact, Bart Bart Sabrell has got another. I'm going to do, scare quote documentary called like it's called like Astronauts Gone Mad or something, you know. And it's essentially him, you know, doorstepping these astronauts and asking them, you know incredibly technical or difficult or awkward or unexpected questions um, on the spot. And bear in mind, this is decades after these, you know, men have, have been to the moon. Some of them are, you know, not, not in, uh, not in the flush of youth. And I'm not, I don't know exactly how, uh, you know, how, how good their faculties are in all cases. Right. There's, there's one particular example of, again, uh, I think Alan Bean, getting a bit confused about the Van Allen radiation belts, right? And this is, you know, in in the late 90s or early 2000s, right? You know, like literally decades after he's been to the moon and he's been asked about a specific technical detail of, of his mission, right? Which he doesn't remember off the top of his head. So, you know, uh, advice to take away from that question, don't, don't try any kind of live debates, right? The, uh, you know, debate, you, we, we've heard enough talk in previous talks about how difficult it is to to try and you know have a a, a rational uh, and intellectually honest discussion with types of folk like these, so please proceed with caution, folks. And of course, if you don't actually know the answer to a question yourself, they think they've won. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, if you if you give that impression that you can answer questions and then and then they find a gotcha, and they will find a gotcha, right? Unless you're like an encyclopedia of space trivia, you're you're not going to know everything that they're going to have to throw at you. So, you know, just don't go there. Okay, we're back to Igor, who says, have you ever had the opportunity to talk with the most stubborn deniers? How many of you, how many of them <laughs> punch? And he, he adds a rider that SITP doesn't condemn violence so, and all that. Well, well look, when you're, when you're short and skinny and weak as me, then, you know, punching is, would not be a good option, even if I was the violent kind. So, no, look, I mean, let's follow on from the previous question. I've not made a habit of getting into any debates uh, i follow the um apollo moon ho- hoax facebook group um i've never responded to anybody in there or posted anything in there it's not my place to do so a um, couple of the talks i've been to um there's been some some moon landing deniers in there pretty quiet though um although with the panel at glasgow science center there was somebody who was asking some really strange questions but there was much more knowledgeable people than me in the panel who were able to to adequately answer those questions so um uh, i've not gone there uh, igor and i don't plan to uh, don't blame me for that um parrot lady asks why don't they believe all space visits are fake why focus just on the moon or, or do well, they? well well some of them do like um if if you want to to have a laugh Join that Facebook group and see how angry the moon hoaxers get when there's a flat earther saying stuff in their in their group. It, it's so and 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 that those are the ones that they just don't believe in space travel at all, right? So, the some of the moderators of that that Facebook group are, you know, regularly post saying, "Let's be very clear, we are not flat earthers. We do believe in space travel. We believe in lower Earth orbit space travel, and but we do not believe in the moon missions." So. Um, you know that the, there there is obviously differing opinions amongst those hoaxers as to what has been faked, but um, you know most of them it's like yeah yeah we've been to space, but we've not been outside the Van Allen. The Van Allen radiation belts are the kind of um, you know the the limit for most of those hoaxers. Okay, you've really got me thinking now. So, are the flat earthers who believe that we did no. go to the moon? No, 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 not that I'm aware of. Maybe, maybe there are. Uh, but you know, I think most of the flat earthers think that think that there's some kind of project, projection or a dome anyway, right? And I know there's different models, but um, I, no, I don't think. Let, let's page Marsh on that one. I don't know for sure. I I was just really hoping that there would be, and we could get them in a fight or something. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving on to uh, Skeptical Gumby from Oxford, who asks, what do the moon landing denialists say about the Russian space programme? Um, well, they're, they're, they're 
relatively complimentary about it, um, you know, and because the the main narrative you get from them, right? And 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 Bill Casing kind, you know, the who who wrote the first pamphlet slash book about the hoax, you know, he called it like the billion dollar hoax or the multi billion dollar hoax or something like that, right? You know, the 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 allegation is that you know NASA or the government or the evil forces above them were using the you know the Apollo missions as a means of just siphoning public money into their coffers, right? And no doubt it's into some pockets as well, right? So um, they're they're set and and they use the perceived success of the Russian space program as further evidence that America would not have been able to make it to the moon. Because um, as, I, as I showed in one of my slides, the Russians were certainly ahead um, when, when it comes to space exploration in many, many other aspects apart from sending humans to the moon. So, um, you know, I, I would imagine if the Russians had gone to the moon as well, then there'd be a schism. There'd be some that say, no, 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 even the Russians can't go outside the Van Allen radiation belt. And there'd be others that say, well, the Russians did go to the moon. Uh, it was the Americans that faked it. So who knows? Yeah, no, you can't deny the Rus anything to do with the Russians because I always get completely irrelevant to your talk, but I always get super warm, fuzzy feelings about the Russian space missions because that all started off the year I was born. And Sputnik was my baby nickname and Laika went up just a few days after I was born. And so I just, I have this sort of fellow feet some i don't you know how you get these ridiculous associations that you make and you just can't get free of them so russian space missions good anyway you didn't well, no, to as, know that as, but, well, i was hey. going to say like um if any any of you folks out there enjoy the citation needed podcast they did a great episode about yuri gagarin which was you know hilarious but very interesting at the same time check that out strong recommend and i think i mentioned as well like curious droid um YouTube channel has done a number of uh, a number of videos about the Russian space program as well, and as I say, one in particular about the, some some of the problems that they encountered when trying trying to get their their lunar program or their crewed lunar um, program going. So check those out. Brilliant, brilliant channel. Right, and um, Arthur Wolf Rett asks the next question. He says, there are lots of reasons for people believing the moon landing was a hoax or fake. What percentage of people do you think buy into the hoax just because they dislike the US government? <sighs> well, I mean, you know, the, 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 one in, the one in six stat that I gave in my presentation was from a British survey, right? I, I'm not, I can't remember what the figures are. In, in the US, but I, I would imagine it would it would be worse, right? Uh, and and I think I think that 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 high number of disbelievers in the UK is kind of a symptom of the UK being influenced by American culture, right? And ha, huh, I, I I've got sympathy for them, right? Uh, you know, if you think about some of the other things that the American government were doing at the time of the Apollo missions, right, with all of the the civil rights movement happening and, 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 you know, what the CIA were doing against it. I completely agree, right? And, you know, I'm old school punk myself, so, you know, distrusting and disliking the government is, you know, something I tend to sign on to, right? But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's an American mindset that, um, you know, pushes way too many of them over the edge and you know there's there's numerous reasons for that and lack of education or proper science education is certainly one of them okay um another question from dave jenkins uh, apart from it not existing flat earthers are you aware of any Mars la Mars landing conspiracies in relation to the unmanned landers no um i think it's just, i think it's just the um just the flat earthers that don't think that's happening um because bear in mind, you know, the some of the well, one of the images I showed in the presentation was the moon hoaxers using a Mars lander picture with the crater sort of craters underneath the um, the landing module in comparison to the lunar one. So they're they're mostly on board with that. As I say, you know, the the you know, bear in mind my 
you know, other than, you know, those kind of big documentaries that I watched, my main sort of interaction with the, the, the moon hoaxing movement right now is based on some Facebook groups and, you know, some some occasional tweets, right? And, and as I said, they are... They're on board with space travel, um, just manned or crewed space travel outside of the Van Allen belt seems to be their their lane. So, like you were suggesting about the unmanned landings on the moon either? No. Just, no. just the manned ones? No, uh, I mean, it, if oh, they, they only get uppity about it if there is, like like the example I showed of the Chang'e um, rover, and no stars in the background, right? They don't like that picture. Can't imagine why not. Um, but it's, you know, other than other than that, they're fine with actual, you know, um, rockets being sent there with with equipment on it and rovers on it. So you mentioned earlier um, in answer to your question, you somebody mentioned the retro reflectors as a as a way of proving that they did go. How do the uh, hoaxes explain that? Uh, well, yeah, th this follows on nicely from, from, well, there's a couple, right? Some of them say, well, look, the, the surface of the moon's very reflective anyway. You don't need a retro reflector on there to get a, a, a bounce back. And you, apparently you can get a weak signal bounce back um, from just the surface, right? But others will, will claim that at the same time, the Apollo astronauts, oh, and by the way, so in, in the first edition of Bill Casing's book, um, he alleged that um, Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins, um, when the Apollo missions were happening, were off in Vegas um, hanging out with strippers and stuff. Uh, a later edition of his book um, changed that and just said, look, the, you know, the Saturn V rockets were real. They just went into near-Earth orbit, right? So... Huh. So the moon hoaxers were, are, are saying that at the time that um, the Collins, Armstrong and uh, Aldrin were, were orbiting the Earth, like being all secret and quiet, shh, they also sent a real unmanned uh, probe to the moon to, to put the, the retro reflectors on there and presumably to bounce a radio signal to fool all of those amateur radio, um, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts and stuff. So, yeah, like, may, you know, may, maybe that reinforces my answer to a previous question. They're absolutely on board with uncrewed missions to, to the moon because that's part of their fake narrative. That's an awful lot of work that people went to. Uh, oh, yeah, almost like it would be <laughs> easier just to go to the moon, right? Yeah. So thanks to Gray the Earthling for that last question. And the next one is from River Sol. Um, if any, what are the underlying motives of moon landing deniers? Um, Why? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I think motive is a, is a strong word. Um, I, and, and look, as I said, just at the end of my presentation, like, you know, moon, moon landing denial is, I think I think there's another question in the slider that describes it as a, as a gateway drug, right? It's you know probably replaced by 9/11 truthers, right? In in modern days, right? But you know not believing we went to the moon or believing that JFK was you know assassinated by the CIA or something else or it was an inside job, you know th those are your stepping stones to um, you know David Icke. Um, level lizard lizard person territory, right? So, I I don't necessarily think there's a motive. I just think there's there's a narrative that that is so enticing to cling on to. You know, like if you're not doing great in life, right? Let's say your life isn't working out the way that you thought it would be. Isn't it great to assume that it's not your fault? You're being lied to by your government. They're manipulating you. And, you know, they lied about the moon landing, so they're also lying about this, 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 and this, right? And this is the problem we have, right? Everybody immediately assumes the government are lying every time they do something, and that's just not the case, right? They're not nearly competent enough to lie effectively 100% of the time, right? So I, I don't think there's a motive. I just I think it's a symptom rather than anything else, Cleo. Right, so 
like the pick a conspiracy and feel good about it. Yeah, it's just another one for some people to pick. It, yeah. Exactly. You know, it, it it does it does make you feel makes you feel a little bit Sherlock Holmes like like I've solved I've solved a puzzle here. You know, I've I've figured out who perpetrated something, and you know, the vast majority of the the public don't see that and they don't get it. And it's in, like again in the Facebook group, you still do see unironic use of the word sheeple right which which is unbelievable now that people actually still use that term but hey they do and it makes them feel nice and they're in a little most they're mostly in an echo chamber i should say right as i say there's occasional flat earthers that go in there and like ruin things for them there's also occasional skeptics i guess like me that aren't quite as polite that occasionally go in there and go here's an answer to your question you're a bunch of fucking idiots right and you know that doesn't go down well but essentially it's an echo chamber those those little groups right so you know they've they've found like-minded people and they are smarter than the average member of the public and that feels nice right all right um here's a question i think you you've actually touched on in terms of the number of people who are involved at nasa but um are there any theories about how NASA kept this quiet for so long? You know, is everyone in on it? Brian Cox, mm. the lot. Brian Cox, definitely. Another yeah, radio, like I, I, I've never sat down and, and tried to run the numbers. I don't, I don't think I've got, I don't think I've got the knowledge to run the numbers. But if you look at it in simplistic terms, as I said, like all, all, all six missions, seven if you count Apollo thirteen as well, right? Because they allegedly, you know, they went round the moon, they just didn't get to land on it, right? Um, certainly a fair amount of people in mission control, um, certain amount of people high up in the government, and assuming assuming that there was, um, you know, a, a fake recording in a studio or in Area 51, then, you know, Stanley Kubrick or whoever the director was and every single other person that did set design and special effects and anything like that, like, quite easily quite quickly it goes into the tens and then the hundreds right as i mentioned a lot of the a lot of the you know ibm uh employees at the time were monitoring you know bear in mind how how primitive computing was back then you know it was very it was very segmented the computer monitoring that was going on you know there'd be one person kind of looking at one particular set of processes which was a big box in a in a cupboard somewhere right so you needed like loads and loads of staff and these people are looking at it in real time and using that and advising and and talking to mission control who are talking to um talking to the astronauts in real time right so unless they orchestrated all of that so you need somebody to write that damn script as well and that's a multi-day script um so very very quickly it goes from tens to hundreds probably into the thousands right um and I think by that point, and, you know, we've not had any dramatic deathbed confessions, you know, not like nothing, like nothing like that at all. So um, I, I find it really hard to believe. And I think it's telling that no hoax or that I'm aware of has ever put together like, 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 like a playbook. Like, here's exactly how they would do it. Right. Uh, and one thing I've heard. Steve Novella talk about a lot of times about conspiracy theorists on on the Skeptic Sky podcast is they don't really put together a full story. All they do is anomaly hunt. They just look for they just look for potential anomalies. They won't they won't give you an actual full narrative. There's a good YouTube channel as well called Professor Dave Explains, and he's done a number of videos about where he's sort of done 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 back and forward to kind of video debates if you like with uh, with flat earthers right and the one thing that he comes back to regularly is look flat earthers show me a model show me a model of how your system works you know how can we have daylight here and nighttime there and this type of gravity working and the lunar cycle as it is how how does that work give me a working model right marsh has said the same and his discussions with flat earthers nobody's be able to none of the flat earth communities be able to agree on a single kind of end-to-end -end model of how that might work, right? There's different options, but nobody's completed it, and all of them have got holes in it, right? It's the same applies with the moon landings. They've never done that, and I don't think they could do that, because I think if they tried to, they'd realise how impossible it would be 
to put to put together a fake, uh, you know, a fake moon landing, six fake moon landings, plus another couple of additional crewed missions that went, you know, down to the moon or round the moon, near the moon, and so on and so forth. It just it's ridiculous. So I'll just take a, a brief sidestep here and say we've had some brilliant questions, which we haven't put to Brian um, because they were they were just funny in themselves. And I don't think he could have. There wasn't really an answer being looked for. But I hope that you've all had time. I'm sure you've all looked through Slido and seen them yourself. So uh, thank you to everyone for all those questions. We're not ignoring them. It's just that they were better read than answered. Um, most of them. Most of them. One which I need to address is why haven't we seen any pets? Um, yeah. Because uh, there aren't yeah, any pets. Yeah, I, I, no pets, I'm afraid. Uh, I've got a nearly three-year-old child. and I want a cat, but I don't want a cat and a child and a young child at the same time. So um, come back in about maybe, let me see, a year and two months when a little, when a little one's four. That's, that's going to be cat time, okay? Watch this space. We will. We'll be back. Um, and i got a couple of fun questions to finish with. The first one's from Bremner. He asks, uh, you say we went to the moon, but it happened in the daytime when the moon isn't even out. Explain that. <laughs> well, I mean, they had to do it at a time where they could see what was happening. It would have been really dark otherwise for them, right? I don't know how I meant to answer that one. <laughs> so they either see and miss it or hit it. That they either hit it behind. Yeah. They could do that. Is that that sort of exactly. your answer, yeah? <laughs> That's good enough. Um, and uh, Grimbeard has the last question for us. I think this is actually really important. If all of these photos and videos are really from the moon, where are all the clairs? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, conspiracy theorists haven't come up with that one yet. Um, I don't know. I, that's a very UK reference for people of a certain age and older, by the way. So, um, you know, Grimbeard, you're giving yourself away with that type of question. And for those of you that didn't get it, congratulations for being A, young and B, foreign or, or one of the two. Um, I, I envy you on both counts. Oh, come on. I think we need to guide people towards the clangers at sure, this point. Sure, yeah. Get, 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 get giggling, folks. Right. OK, well, it's time to wrap up now. So um, thank you very much, Brian. I, that was really, really good. And thank you so much for stepping in um, at the last minute. Um, uh, a reminder that uh, we've got the lock-ins razor tonight. There'll be links to that in the Twitch chat. Um, and a big thank you to Laurie and Igor on the tech side and for and to Gerald for being my backup in case everything fell to pieces at my end and um, also for managing those questions. That was not an easy job tonight, so thank you very much. And we'll be back here in a fortnight, Thursday the 24th of February for our next talk. And so we'll, that's it for tonight. See you in the razor. Bye.